Hello, everyone. Uh, if we haven't met before, my name is Dr. Eric Caleri. I'm the Klein Curator for Theater and Performing Arts here at the Harry Ransom Center. And today I'm going to be walking you through the Tennessee Williams exhibition uh, that we're doing as part of Stories to Tell. This is celebrating the 75th anniversary of Williams's The Glass Menagerie. Arthur Miller uh, has a great quote, actually, about The Glass Menagerie. He says, the revolutionary newness of it uh, was in its poetic lift, but an underlying hard dramatic structure was what earned the play its right to, to sing poetically. That structure of storytelling and character made the very private play available to anyone capable of feeling at all. It was an incredible play and a really profound shift in American theater when it came out. It's a memory play. If you haven't read it, I, I really encourage you to. There's copies at the library. I think we'll have copies on sale in the gift shop. Uh, but at the time that it came out, it was pretty radical for what it was doing. It inspired a whole different genre of kinds of American plays that challenged uh, American exceptionalism and uh, the American dream that comes out of, of the Great Depression. And so you have people like Arthur Miller who see the Glass Menagerie in 1945, 1946, and uh, really get inspired by that and, and leads him to write plays like All My Sons and Death of a Salesman. There's a genealogy that you can trace from this one play. It's really important and we have incredible collections here at the Ransom Center that help to tell the story. So, uh, so why, why this one? Uh, for one thing, it's an anniversary year, so it's a good time to be talking about the Glass Menagerie. Um, if you've been with the Ransom Center for a little bit, you've noticed that I've done a couple uh, stories to tell displays uh, about playwrights broadly. Uh, so there was a, uh, a, an occasional playwright series at one point. Uh, there was a display on Sam Shepard. There was one on Terrence McNally. There was one recently on Arthur Miller. Uh, this gave me the chance to really focus in on one particular play and show what's in a playwright's archive uh, by focusing in a bit. Um, so that to me was a, a really exciting opportunity. And also the kinds of things that you see in a playwright's archive. So you'll, you'll look around in the display, you'll see personal letters, you'll see family photographs, you'll see journal entries, you'll of course see manuscript drafts of, of the play in development, uh, but then you'll see also records of its production. Uh, and these networks are really important to us. Uh, and that sense of networks too, Tennessee Williams started placing his papers here in the early 1960s. And one of our acquisition strategies at the Ransom Center has been to look at one particular person and then branch out, look at their networks and try to collect around them so that when people come and do research, they have that, uh, that one-stop one shopping kind of place uh, where they, could, they can really dig in deep into topics. So William started placing his papers here in the early 1960s uh, and then uh, his mother actually placed her papers in a lot of the family photographs and the letters that Williams wrote home as a child. Uh, she placed those here in the mid-1960s. Uh, Audrey Wood, who was Tennessee Williams' agent, her papers came in the early 90s. Uh, Lorette Taylor, who was the original Amanda, the actress uh, in The Glass Menagerie, uh, her papers are here. Paul Bowles, who wrote the original uh, compositions, the incidental music to the play, uh, his papers are here. It's, it's really incredible, and across these different collections, uh, you can help tell a, a, full, a full story about a single play like The Glass Menagerie. So it's an opportunity for that. Uh, I also wanted to be able to show the process of a play in production. So uh, from the early influences uh, that would lead to the story through biography. That's along this wall. Along the back wall, there is uh, the drafts themselves, so the, the drafting process. Then along the side wall, there is uh, production material and the uh, different aspects of production, from design to acting to critical review uh, to stories from the actor, and then into adaptation with, uh, with the development of a film uh, adaptation of, of the play. And so uh, really what I want to do is to be able to give you a, a broad sense of that. Um, what is the process of, of creating a great masterpiece like The Glass Menagerie? And then finally, speaking of masterpieces, uh, The Glass Menagerie really is a work of genius. And one of the things that I want to highlight is that genius doesn't come easy. And this is a real gift for a place like the Ransom Center, especially being on a university campus. So uh, 
I think there's this perception that it is, it is truly a remarkable play. It's very well written. Uh, and it's hard without seeing the drafts to visualize how that happens. And in reality, it took Tennessee Williams over seven years in countless dozens and dozens of drafts to be able to get to the really solid play that we, uh, we love and appreciate today. Uh, so for writers and artists and other people who come to the Ransom Center, that can be actually really comforting to know that such an important work like this uh, doesn't come easy. It, it really does take work, rejection, failure, rewriting, revision, drafting over and over and over again to get to the final product. Uh, and this really is the humanities. This is the story that we tell here at the Ransom Center time and time again. It's it, it gets really to the core of the human experience. It's that struggle to communicate. It's about creativity. It's about engagement and, and that desire to connect with people. Uh, so uh, so that's, that's why, that's why this. And hopefully those are some of the stories that you can share with people who are coming to visit. I'm gonna walk you through some of the items, uh, just give you a little bit of background on a couple things. Uh, do read the label text though. Uh, there's also, I, I tried to balance visual material with text. It's one of the real challenges we have at the Ransom Center, we have a lot of text, uh, but the text is also really exciting. So do spend some time uh, reading the letters, reading the journal. Uh, there's a mix also of handwriting and typewriting. Uh, I tried to do that just to make it a little bit easier to, to be able to engage with, but there's some really good stuff here. Uh, the display starts with a self-portrait of Tennessee Williams. Uh, he was also a painter in addition to being a writer. Uh, the, the painting uh, side of his creative ex uh, practice, he thought of as secondary, uh, but an important part to supporting his writing. Uh, when the writing wasn't going well, he needed a creative practice to fall back on. Uh, so he learned how to paint starting in the 1930s. Uh, and then uh, went off to college, really started writing heavily throughout the 1940s, wrote heavily, uh, but gave up largely on painting. Uh, by the 1950s, he was really struggling, uh, and his therapist says, you know, you really do need an outlet, some sort of creative outlet that isn't writing, uh, so that when the writing isn't going well, you have something to fall back on. Uh, and so he started painting again. Uh, this self-portrait uh, is, is actually a little bit of, a, of an in-between. He did, he did paint a little bit in the 1940s. Uh, this is right around 1945. We have about 28 paintings of Tennessee Williams's in the collection. Some of them are self-portraits, some of them are portraits of others, some are landscapes or um, still lifes. Uh, but it's a wonderful collection and, and a, a wonderful way to be able to sneak that in uh, at the beginning. Uh, here we have uh, family photographs, and again, a lot of these came from Tennessee Williams' mother, Edwina. Uh, this is her up here. I love uh, these photos. I, I, I chose these specific photos. There's hundreds of them in the collection, but I chose these for specific reasons. Uh, for one thing, I wanted to be able to show uh, the sort of classic Southern Belle and her shift to the matronly uh, daughter of the American Revolution, which is really at the core of the character of Amanda in The Glass Menagerie. Uh, this is considered to be one of his most biographical plays. Uh, he grew up in St. Louis, uh, and this is Tennessee here, uh, outside the family apartment in St. Louis, uh, here in front and then on the side of the building. Uh, and he really had a hard time there. He thought, uh, he thought it was a, a sort of a grim, bland place to grow up, no offense to St. Louis, but uh, it was always really hard for him to come back there. This is his sister Rose, uh, who figures very prominently in a lot of his work and, and a lot of his thinking. Uh, he was devoted to his sister Rose, they loved each other very much. Uh, she suffered from schizophrenia and uh, had a, had a lobotomy uh, in 1943 while Tennessee was drafting The Glass Menagerie. And this was a, a really big deal to him. He knew that she was sad and suffering and, and uh, suffered in, in particular from depression. Uh, and it was his mother's choice to have Rose lobotomized. And the lo lobotomy didn't go well. Uh, and she uh, ended up having to be institutionalized for the rest of her life. Williams was absolutely devastated by this. He found out about it while he was living away from home, away from St. Louis, uh, and really took responsibility for that. He felt like his not being at home meant that he wasn't able to protect her. 
and this challenge, right, this, this inability to protect his sister and to take care of her and also his mother uh, is one of the core themes of The Glass Menagerie. This challenge of wanting to be an artist, the character Tom, which is Tennessee Williams' birth name, uh, it's the character's name, uh, Tom wants to be an artist and he can't leave home until uh, he knows that his sister and his mother are taken care of. Uh, so this really, what I wanted to emphasize with this is that, that connection between biography and with, uh, with the subject of the play. From the personal archives too, one of my favorite letters is this letter from uh, Tennessee, from Tom to his grandfather, uh, who was a, a, a reverend, a priest in the Episcopal Church and was living in uh, Memphis at the time. Uh, Tennessee was applying for a grant, a thousand dollar grant from the Rockefeller Foundation. And in this letter, he is, uh, is basically just filling him in on the application process. And he says, uh, I have this, this part of the application that I need you to send from Memphis. Because if you send it from uh, St. Louis and they have my actual address, uh, they might, they're going to be, what is it? Uh, it is essential to keep my real address a secret at present as they investigate family finances. It might be misled in thinking me to be uh, the pampered son of the well-to-do. So this perception nationally of living in St. Louis uh, might make people think that he's actually more well-off than he is by you know, living in a very small suburban uh, apartment building in uh, the outside of St. Louis. Uh, so he asks his grandfather to, to send it on his behalf. He was actually successful in getting that grant, and it's what brought him finally from St. Louis to New York, where uh, he could really start developing his voice as a playwright for the first time. Uh, prior to his leaving, this is another letter from uh, right around the same time, actually. Uh, this is about, both of these are from about November, December 1939. Uh, he'd already gone to college in Iowa at this point and studied uh, writing at the uh, Iowa Writers uh, uh, Conference. And so uh, that was an incredible experience for him, but he really never got the chance to see much theater in St. Louis or in Iowa. It was really not until he went to New York that he really got this exposure and met, met connections that would help launch his career. Uh, but he did manage, uh, before going to New York, to get an agent, Audrey Wood. And like I said before, her papers are also here at the Ransom Center. And so uh, this letter, uh, he is talking about writing a new play, not The Glass Menagerie, but something else. But he really talks about the struggle of having to write in this environment uh, with his family in St. Louis and this sort of uh, suffering of, of being in, in suburban America, mid Midwestern America. Uh, he talks about uh, the fear that he has of his mother throwing away his drafts and purging the attic, uh, which you'll read in the label, uh, influenced him greatly in trying to establish his archive here at the Ransom Center. Um, he also talks about a woman named Molly Thacker. And if you'll remember from Arthur, the Arthur Miller display that we had here in Stories to Tell a little bit ago, uh, Molly Thacker ended up marrying uh, um, Elia Kazan. And she was the one who, uh, if you'll remember that two-page letter that Miller wrote to her about the crucible, where he lays out the crucible for the first time, uh, that's the same person. Molly Thacker had a long history of supporting playwrights uh, and became head of the playwriting unit at the actor studio. And so even early on in, in Williams's career, she's helping to shepherd him and mentor him through uh, his early career as a playwright. And then he says this really great thing. Uh, my life is hopelessly circumscribed by the wholesale shoe business on one side, which is what his father did, uh, and the DAR on the other, the Daughters of the American Revolution, his mother, on the other. Although I must admit that there is considerably less anxiety about the next meal than there was on the coast. Uh, he had lived in, in California at the time slightly, just for a, a, a little while um, in Southern California by himself, and was basically living in poverty for a while. Uh, but he says, but I'm one of those noble animals who would rather starve in a jungle than grow fat in a cage. Uh, it's great, a great uh, thing, a, a really dramatic thing to say and a typically Tennessee Williams thing to say. Uh, he says, does, uh, he's wondering whether or not Molly can help him with the fellowship. Uh, and he's sort of going on about this. And he says, please don't think I'm a whining spineless, spineless sissy. I'm really not. Or am I? No, I'm only thinking about my art. Uh, and then I can suppose you can hear that horrible deprecating laugh of mine. 
Don't let this give you nightmares. Next time, I promise to write a starring vehicle for Shirley Temple if you want me to. Prologue by Margaret Barker. So there's this, this conflict that he has that you can even see. It's playful, but it's also real, where he is trying to balance what he thinks of as his art, the craft, with trying to make a living as a writer. And the, the vehicles, the projects that he knows will make money and will be appealing to broad audiences. Uh, but clearly, what he really wants to do is his art. Uh, here in his journal, uh, this is a little bit later, 1941, this is a journal from uh, one of his early stints living in New Orleans. Uh, he's gotten the fellowship by this point. He's had a play called Battle of Angels uh, that had uh, premiered in Boston in 1940 as a Broadway tryout, uh, but it failed spectacularly and never made it to Broadway. Uh, the Theater Guild, which produced Battle of Angels, gave him a small stipend basically to continue work on Battle of Angels. And he took that stipend, uh, went to New Orleans to try to work on it. Um, it's an incredibly modest stipend. He, he was really broke most of the time. Um, and uh, yeah, was uh, never really ended up getting back to Battle of Angels during that period. It took him about 20 years before he would return to it and uh, it would reappear as the play uh, Orpheus Descending in the late 1950s. But here in New Orleans, uh, in this particular journal entry, he's talking, uh, trying to figure out where all of his money went. And so he talks about spending money on some movies, a uh, little bit of food, uh, and he really, for the first time, he says he's breaking down his budget uh, and the money just completely disappears. Uh, you'll also notice if you read it, and I do recommend reading it, uh, he says uh, at the top that he has crabs. He's experimenting with his sexuality for the first time. And in another diary entry, when he discovers that he's got crabs, uh, he also notes that he doesn't have the money to pay for the medication to get rid of them. And he says, I'm literally a lousy writer. I find that really amusing. And, and again, typically Tennessee. If you have trouble with the handwriting or you want to read more of the journals or even more of the letters, there's been a lot of really great collected uh, publications of his work. There's a two volume set of the collected letters of Tennessee Williams. And then there's a really wonderful book called Notebooks that's really mostly the, the notebooks and journals of Tennessee Williams, uh, all transcribed out. A lot of them here from the Ransom Center collections. Moving over to this wall, this, uh, what I really wanted with this part was to just visually give the visitor a sense of the drafting process. I, I, I could fill an entire stories to tell exhibit uh, with just a discussion on Tennessee Williams drafting of this one play. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of drafts and each one of them is completely different from the other. Uh, and so I knew I didn't have the time and the space to be able to really walk the audience through that, uh, through those, that, that specific drafting process. And so my goal instead was really to just give them the visual of some of the different drafts. And again, give that sense of the time, the seven years that it took for this play to, to gestate. Um, and the, each one has a different title. So Stairs to the Roof, The Koopy Doll, Daughter of Revolution, The Pretty Trap, uh, Carolers Are Candle is one of my favorites. Uh, this is, it starts, it's, slightly chronological. Uh, the challenge, again, also with Tennessee Williams is that he doesn't date his drafts, and so it's very hard uh, to be able to sort of get a chron chronology of, of how these plays developed. Um, so what I've been trying to do is uh, look through his letters and look through his journal entries for references to specific titles of projects he's working on to try to help create this chronology from that. It's a slow, slow process. Uh, but on March 5th, uh, here at the Ransom Center, uh, I'll be doing a talk uh, about the drafting process for the Glass Menagerie. Uh, I hope to see you there. Please tell uh, visitors as well. Um, we'll be having actors from the Hidden Room Theater also joining me for that, where they will be performing scenes from some of these drafts too. So it'll be the first time that some of these plays have actually ever been semi-performed. Um, really exciting though. Uh, so uh, if you want to look at any of these drafts, these are facsimile title pages. The, uh, the full drafts are in the archives upstairs, so you're welcome to set up a research account. Anybody is welcome to set up a research account and look through them. So as you're taking people through, make sure you mention that. The reading room's right upstairs. Anybody with a photo, photo ID can set up an account. And if folks are wanting to read through these drafts, they can. 
Uh, here, uh, there's a, another letter to Audrey Wood where he is uh, specifically talking about the Gentleman Caller, which is an early draft of the Glass Menagerie, uh, and the, the challenges he's having uh, writing that. Uh, yeah, he says, things are in a bad shape here. I won't go into the wretched details, but it's like a Chekhov play only sadder and wilder. <laughs> it's so good. That's such a Tennessee Williams thing to say. Uh, and then this wonderful uh, little essay that he wrote called Why the Title that explains uh, how he landed on the title of The Glass Menagerie. And in this one essay really makes that link apparent between uh, the subject matter of the play and his own biography, his own personal story. Again, on this wall, we move into production. So we've gone from drafting now into production. Uh, this is from the artist Joe Melziner. Uh, this is a tricky name to pronounce, but it's, it's a really important one in the American theater. Joe Melziner was uh, one of the great American scene designers. Uh, he did a lot of Tennessee Williams. He did some Arthur Miller. Uh, it, so many of the great plays of the American theater in the 1940s and 50s were designed by him. They were known for being moody, for being symbolic, for being slightly abstract, while also sort of having uh, a realism, grounded in realism. Williams's play, like I said before, is a memory play. It's told as a flashback from an older uh, character named Tom, who's looking back at his uh, young adulthood uh, in this decision that he made ultimately to leave his mother and, and daughter, or not daughter, sister, uh, in, in their uh, tenement style apartment in St. Louis. So to get this sense of, uh, of a memory of a flashback, uh, the play begins with this alley look at the apartment complex. And uh, the access to the apartment is actually through the fire escape. It's really dark, but this, uh, yeah. Uh, the brick wall is painted scrim, and scrim is uh, a sort of a netted fabric that when you front light it, you can see what you've painted on it, but when you backlight it, it becomes translucent and you can see through it. And it has this sort of gauzy quality to it that really elicits that sense of memory. And so as Tom is, is telling his opening monologue, speaking his opening monologue, those lights come on behind and you can see his mother suddenly appear and his, his sister and this, this sort of memory takes shape. And then as we really, as an audience, we really move into the story the wall lifts up and uh, we're in the living room of the apartment. Um, here we have uh, original production photos from the, uh, from the play. Uh, this is from the original production. You have Lorette Taylor as Amanda Wingfield, Eddie Dowling, who uh, played Tom. Uh, Eddie was also the director and the uh, producer in addition to being the star actor. Uh, this is also Eddie. This is a popular thing to do in the play. Uh, that the father, the portrait of the father that's always present on the wall is usually uh, a photo of um, the actor playing Tom, uh, but dressed in a soldier suit. And then Julie Hayden, who played Laura uh, in the original production, an incredible cast. And uh, as I said before, Lorette Taylor's papers are here at the Ransom Center. There's a great documentary film called Broadway, The Golden Age that I can't recommend enough. They interviewed a whole bunch of actors who were stars on the Broadway stage in the 1940s and 50s. And the interviewer asked each one of them, what is your most memorable moment uh, from that period? What is the most memorable play that you saw? And they were expecting all of these different responses. And fascinatingly, almost every single one of them said that their most memorable moment from the, the golden age of Broadway was seeing Lorette Taylor play Amanda in The Glass Menagerie. She was an incredible actress, uh, really towards the end of her career. Uh, she hadn't actually been on Broadway for, for almost a decade before this. She had been sort of forced into retirement. Her husband had died. Uh, her husband was a, a, a fairly well-respected playwright who had written many star vehicles for Lorette Taylor, including a very popular play called Peg of My Heart, 16-year-old Peg, an Irish immigrant. Uh, Lorette Taylor played the 16-year-old Peg until she was well into her 60s. Uh, but the style, those plays that she was really known for, the, the kind of melodrama, uh, wasn't current anymore. It wasn't what people wanted to see. And there just wasn't the audience for her. Uh, but this changed everything. This play uh, gave her a new audience and a new opportunity to show what she could do. And it was rooted in a sense of American realism that 
really was rare at the time. If you look back at uh, early 1930s and 40s films, you see that there's a sort of very presentational style of acting. She wasn't. And what everybody said, what everybody commented, was how realistic she was. Maureen Stapleton, who was a Tennessee Williams favorite, an actress uh, who, who did many of Williams' plays, said that she saw Lorette do this play at least three or four times. And she was really upset the first time she saw it because she felt like they had just pulled this woman off the street and uh, she wasn't really acting. There was no work, there was no sense of effort. And of course, that's it, right? Maureen Stapleton said that it, uh, it took her a while to finally realize that that's the work of the actor. If you can do that, if you have that kind of mastery of your craft and of your, of your own body, brilliant. The, the result is really, really amazing. Uh, and the critics recognized that. They recognized that not only was Lorette Taylor an amazing actress, but this play that Tennessee Williams had written, his first major commercial success, uh, was groundbreaking and revolutionary. It started out first in Chicago, and this is why I say 45 and 46. It is the 75th anniversary. I'm saying the 75th anniversary of the Broadway premiere. Uh, the play actually uh, previewed as a Broadway tryout in Chicago in December of 1945, uh, but then it opened on Broadway in March, at the end of March uh, 1920, uh, 1946. Uh, here we have a, a uh, this is a, a newspaper review from the New York Times, Lewis Nichols uh, from 1945. So this is actually reviewing the Chicago preview, the, the Broadway tryout. Um, and it really is a remarkable thing. Um, the anticipation, the, the, the response in Chicago was so strong that the anticipation of it coming to Broadway was immense and the audiences were strong right off the bat, something you don't see very often. Uh, and certainly not the experience that Williams had with Battle of Angels when it tried out in Boston in 1940. This was a game changer for him uh, and really made his name uh, a, household, a household recognition. This is Lorette Taylor here. This is uh, a photograph of her by Carl Van Vechten, who was a famous uh, uh, theater photographer. And then a facsimile of a three-page letter that Taylor wrote to her son uh, shortly after the play opened on Broadway. Uh, and it's a beautiful letter. I know it's a little hard to read, but do give it a go. Your brain does adjust to people's handwriting, so don't, don't get put off by handwriting. Uh, within five to 10 minutes, your brain will adjust and you'll be able to read a lot easier. But the general gist is that uh, she's made it, and it means so much to her that she is in this play, that uh, people are, are finding her again, that uh, she's actually able to pay her bills on her own, uh, that, uh, that the audiences are writing letters to her afterwards. She says, I didn't know whether the postman could or would ring twice, but it did. It's, it really is a beautiful, uh, a beautiful letter. Uh, it also anticipates that there's a film that's, um, that's being done. Uh, I actually also noticed, and I'm gonna get this changed, but this is actually page three, and this is page two. So those will get switched. <laughs> Don't worry about that. Um, so, uh, and then this, uh, they, they did want to make a film adaptation of it uh, with Lorette Taylor starring in it. Uh, and immediately, as the play was on uh, Broadway, they immediately tried to uh, get this, this film uh, underway and to get Williams to do the adaptation himself. Uh, but sadly, Lorette Taylor died within the year of the, the play opening on Broadway. Uh, so it closed and then she died shortly thereafter. Uh, and so the, the film uh, stalled for a number of years. And by the time that the film could actually uh, go into production, Williams had already moved on to other things and didn't want to, sp to spend the time revising a script that he'd already worked on. He wanted to focus on something new, and that was uh, ultimately A Streetcar Named Desire. Uh, but uh, it meant that somebody else did the uh, screen adaptation, um, and Williams chose not to be terribly involved in the making of the film not realizing that they would dramatically change the story uh, and make a happy ending for it. And uh, it really was a dramatically different, different film. Uh, it didn't do terribly bad at the box office, but people who had known the play uh, were baffled. Uh, and Williams tried to do what he could to uh, squash it. 
Uh, so, uh, but the cast was amazing. You'll see Gertrude Lawrence as Amanda, uh, and actually Kirk Douglas, who just passed away, uh, was the original, uh, was the gentleman caller uh, in the film. And then finally, a piece of sheet music uh, from the collection. This is from Audrey Wood's papers. Uh, we also have the papers of Paul Bowles, who did the uh, original composition for uh, the incidental music for The Glass Menagerie. Uh, this is really special. It was thought to have been lost for a number of years, uh, but actually it's uh, not only is the music preserved in Audrey Wood's papers, but we have recordings of it in the papers of Paul Bowles and Lorette Taylor, who had saved a copy herself. Uh, so we have two different copies of it. Uh, they're the only known recordings of this music. They were done two weeks before the show opened on Broadway with the original orchestra. Uh, it is an incredible thing to have. And, and when I knew that I was doing this exhibit, I knew I also wanted to have the music sort of ambiently in the space. And so you will have heard over my talk uh, today uh, a little bit of the music. Uh, there's a speaker on the wall that's sort of pointing it out. Uh, hopefully this isn't an issue. It's, it shouldn't hopefully be distracting. It's at a relatively low enough volume that it's really meant to be ambient. Uh, it also can, some of the pieces tend to be a little bit quieter than others, so you might want to point that out to people. Uh, but hopefully it fills the space and gives it that, that ambient uh, atmosphere. There's a sort of a jazzy number that gives you the sense of the, the rough and grittiness of, of St. Louis that Tennessee was trying to capture. But then there's this uh, beautiful sentimental string music uh, that's the, the Blue Roses, the, uh, the sort of flashbacks of, um, of Laura to her childhood, uh, but also for Amanda, uh, thinking back as, uh, as her Southern Belle years uh, when she grew up in Mississippi. So uh, that's the Tennessee Williams uh, 75th anniversary of the Glass Menagerie display. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you have fun sharing it with people. If you have questions at any time, pass them through Lisa and Monte, I'll get them. Happy to respond at any point. Uh, but thank you so much for your advocacy and thank you for sharing this with our visitors.